The harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. Why did he use that word? God goes to extreme measures to bring the loss to himself. The greatest gift you will ever give this world is your intimacy with God. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all three inside of me. I've got the power right now. I think what Jesus really wants is people to go. I want to be the answer to Jesus' prayer request. Welcome to the Fuel for the Harvest podcast. When this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, then shall the end come. Hey everyone, this is Nathan. Welcome to this latest episode of Fuel for the Harvest. And this is Charlie. We're your host for today. And uh, we're continuing a conversation on hindrances to laboring for God's kingdom and uh, being useful for his kingdom. And uh, Dwight is with us once again. So thanks for joining us. My pleasure. It's good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, let's just dive straight in. Uh, On the last episode, uh, we had talked about sometimes we feel that we're not perfect enough or I'm too unworthy. So am I really useful to God's kingdom? And what would it look like to become useful to God's kingdom? And uh, let's continue. What What are some other hindrances that might come and, and be an obstacle in our way to, to living out God's plan for our lives? Yeah, I, I'm, I think I'm going to capitalize first on one that I, I think has taken a lot of people out of. Uh, the scripture tells us that there's a race marked out for us to run. Um, in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Um, and and that, I think, is take your eyes off yourself and even your sinfulness. Take sin seriously because Jesus did. I mean, he mm-hmm. died for it. So sin is a serious deal. Don't, don't miss the opportunity to take sin seriously. You always confess your sin. Scripture tells us to the one who's faithful and just to forgive. If I've if I've uh, uh, transgressed against my wife, if I've if I've hurt her, I want to immediately mm-hmm. say to her, "I'm so sorry. Please forgive me." Same thing. So you always confess your sin, mm-hmm. but if you if you focus so much on your sin, you no longer see your Savior. Mm-hmm. You'll you'll end up off the racetrack that He's marked for you. Scripture telling you to run with perseverance, the race marked out for you. With perseverance means uh, continue on, keep going on, keep on keeping on. And I have seen so many people. I had a friend uh, who uh, would he'd he'd I'd call it wipe out. Uh, he'd he'd or blow it. You know he'd he'd do something stupid. He'd go out and get wasted, and then you know then he'd tell me, well you know I'm done. <laughs> I said, what do you mean you're done? And he said, well, I, I can't be that kind of kingdom labor and I can't be a Christian. And he was, his eyes were so mm. on himself and his sinfulness, not on his Savior. Um, and so I would try to explain to him, when you learn to walk, uh, you you spent probably more time down than you did up because mm. you're learning to walk. You know, so you kept getting back up again. You kept getting back up again. Sometimes you reach for a hand to help you get up again. Uh, Charlie, I was helping your little tiny g- girl uh, get up off. She'd fallen down and put my little fingers out. And, and our Savior always wants to help restore us. He'd yeah. like for us not to be down very long. Mm. But some of us get down because we've sinned, and we rehearse that sin over and over and over. That's what rehearsing is. We go through it over and over again in our minds. And guess who's camped out on our shoulder? He's called in Scripture the accuser of the brethren. Satan camps out on your shoulder, and he keeps reminding you, look at that terrible thing you did. Look what an awful person you are. And he wants you to rehearse it again and again because he wants you off God's racetrack. He doesn't want you running the race God's marked out for you. So his desire is to keep you off God's racetrack. And if you're not careful, your eye is on your sin and not on your Savior. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it reminds me of a scripture in Colossians 3, uh, which I really love right on on the same topic. Uh, It says in verse 2 of Colossians 3, Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears then you will also appear with him in glory. So that reiteration, fix your eyes on Jesus. Look above. Look at him. Don't look at, at yourself. Don't look at what's around you. And then it continues, though. It doesn't take sin lightly. It says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. 
on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And it continues this list of anger and slander and obscene talk and all these things we know that are not right, that are sinful, but it doesn't say to start there or stay there. It says, fix your eyes above, not on these things. And as you do that, you're going to find the ability to avoid or have power over or fight these even when you mess up. It's fix your eyes above. Uh, ex exactly right. I think we sometimes try to reverse that and start with the other and say, well, I'll do my best to to stop these things and stop looking at them. And then I'll be ready sometime to fix my eyes above. And we never get there. You know, I, I uh, when we think about all the scriptures that teach us the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And we so much, you know, that that the his word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And Romans ten fifteen that says how beautiful are the feet of those that bring good news. It's an interesting thing that in Hebrews 12, it says, uh, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily yeah. entangles us. Entangling. If you can, if you can knock somebody's feet out from under them, their legs out from under them, and I feel like that's what the enemy's trying to do often. Uh, but then he wants to keep you down. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, I, I often would would teach guys that I was coming alongside. I learned this concept called confess and press. Confess your sins to the one who's faithful and just to forgive, and then press on. Paul, the apostle, said, I want to press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. It's forge on, press on, forge forward. Your goal is not to stay down. Mm -hmm. Your goal is to get your eye up on your Savior like Jesus helped Peter when he started sinking in the water because his eyes got on the storm, eyes got himself, and he was failing, starts sinking, and got his eyes back on his Savior, and Jesus helps him back up again, and he's walking on water. So I think confess and press is acknowledge that it's sin, acknowledge that it's wrong, confess it, mm. and press on, yeah. forge forward. And uh, with that, I, I, I have, I've been trying to illustrate to people because not only do they think that God— uh, maybe has perfect people out there. I mean, they kind of in their heads know there aren't any perfect people, and they kind of know in their heads there are no unworthy people. But I think some people have almost pretended to themselves that there are some sinless people. Mm. You know, there are people who they, if they if they sinned ever, you know, it might have been once. Mm. Well, that's not true. That's not according to scriptures, and I've been, I've hung around with too many people for too long. You know, you'll all, we'll always be disappointed with each other. The longer we're with each other, we'll recognize we all needed a savior. Mm. So I'll hold often with a crowd, I'll hold a $20 bill up and I'll say, could anybody use a 20? And, and I'll get a few hands because they're a little hesitant. They're not quite sure what's going on. And then I'll, I'll crumple that U.S. $20 bill up into a little wad, uh, like a little paper wad. Uh, and now it doesn't look like a 20. It, it's all crumpled up and messed up. And I'll say, now who wants it? And I'll ha actually have more hands will go in the air. I say, okay, well, that's because some of you think I could throw it now. You, you wouldn't even have to get out of your seat. So I'm <laughs> going to really change this. It's crumpled up and messed up, but I'm going to get it all dirty. Mm. So I'll put it down on the floor, and with my shoes, I'll grind the dirt of my shoes and the dirt of the floor onto this. And then I'll hold it up and say, now who wants it? And I kid you not, almost 100% of the time, there will be more hands that will go up. And I'll ask the crowd, why do you still, why do you want this? And the bottom line is because it's never lost its value. Yeah. Mm. And neither have you. Those of you who are listening and you got messed up along the way, you, you feel like you got messed up along the way and you even feel like you got dirtied and sin soiled. The Savior would hold his hand up and say, I want you. You haven't lost your value to mm -hmm. me. And I think it's important for our listeners to know that 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 Jesus, starting with his first one he picked, Peter, who says, I'm a sinner. I watched it. I mean, it's the first words that came out of Peter's mouth. I'm a sinner. And Jesus didn't go, oh, well, I'm looking for sinless people. <laughs> you know, Jesus said, come hang out with me. Um, and, and then you would see Jesus spending time with and training and trusting, right. trusting ordinary people that you might say they're sinful people, but they were pointing to the Savior. So that's one of the obstacles. And, and I think the other obstacle is fear. I think people have a lot of fear, mm. like they're just afraid to move forward. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You guys tend to seem, I'm sure, to many people like fearless people. <laughs> but I'm sure there have been times when your knees have been knocking. It's true. Yeah. Uh, many times, even recently, my knees have been knocking. The 
I think that fear is one of the things that has been one of my greatest hindrances personally. Um, like I remember way back when I first felt called into ministry and into mission and uh, I went to this training and we were outside and all this stuff. And then he's like, well, the next stage of the training is let's go to Africa together. And I thought to myself, no way. And I mean, this is so naive and so ignorant, but like, this is literally what was in my mind. I'm like, if I go to Africa, I'm going to die. Like, that's what was in my mind. Like, that's what I thought because I was so sheltered, such a homebody, you know, like that American view of the world and everything. And, uh, I, I was quaking in my boots, and I remember wrestling with this idea of, like, is, is, is Jesus worthy of it? Is he worth it? And uh, finally coming to that conclusion, thankfully, I went to Africa and did not die. And uh, But he uh, put in me a whole new burden for all of these lost yeah. people around the world. And all of a sudden, this fear turned to, to, to a mission. So, yeah, I definitely know what it's like to be full of fear. <laughs> I think uh, when God has his way, mm. he will often, it doesn't matter how, um, uh, I, I've been with with guys who have written uh, and, and talked and led things mm. that almost seem like they're fearless people, but the closer I've gotten to them, they can fess up. There have been moments where everything in me was quaking and shaking. Mm. And, and you see that through the scriptures. That was a common denominator with a lot of people. If God is the boss and he's in charge, he'll usually have you taking steps that will require faith in him to supersede your fear. Yeah. He doesn't ask you that fear. I mean, your knees may Joshua's knees knocked. They mm-hmm. were they were he was frightened. And uh, that's why it, it wasn't once. It wasn't twice. I mean, repetitively there, you know, be strong, be courageous. The Lord your God is with you. And I think that's the key um, to to get over ourselves and get into God's plan. Mm. Fear can never be our leader. Mm. Faith has to be our leader. Faith in the one who calls us and that he's with us. And like you experienced, Nathan, where when you went to Africa, he knew what he was up to. He didn't need to know what you could do. He wanted you to see what he could do. He wanted to get you onto his turf and let you see a God thing. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And and often when he's inviting us to push past our fear, he wants to invite us into a landscape where there's a God thing ahead. <laughs> so he doesn't need you to calculate. He doesn't need you to try to lo- logistically deduce, can I do this? Have I ever done this before? Do I know how to do this? Do I have all my steps? And, mm-hmm. you know, he really doesn't need that. He needs you to just hold on to him and he's with you and begin to... That it doesn't mean you're, you're brain dead. It doesn't mean you push your brain on pause. But it does mean that sometimes you have to get what they call theo in front of logic. Yeah. You have to think theologically. You've got to get God into the equation and go, I don't know how to do this. I've never done this before. I don't know exactly how to do this. Mm-hmm. I don't know how this is going to go. But God has asked me and I'm, he's called me and I'm going to I'm going to step out by faith. So so I've I've tried to teach people the 10 finger prayer and and for any listener, international listener, stateside listener, I I would encourage them to just put all all 10 fingers up, you know, mm-hmm. Charlie with your little girl, I will count her toes and count her hand her little fingers 1 2 3 4 5 1 2 3 4 5 and so we're going to do the 10 finger prayer and it just simply mm-hmm. it's right out of the scriptures and it's I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Starting with your little finger, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If a person's doing that with me, they'll recognize the two smallest parts of the equation are the two small fingers, Mm -hmm. I and me. But when they stop and pause at the index pointer finger, often the way we point is with our index finger, uh, I can do all things through Christ, Mm -hmm. they'll recognize it's not what you don't know how to do. It's all the things he knows how to do that he will do because he's with you. You're not alone. And so I use the 10-finger prayer a lot. Sometimes I'm praying it under the table. Sometimes yeah. I'm praying it with my <laughs> hands in my pocket. You know, sometimes I'm, you know, I'm going down the road praying the 10-finger prayer because God's got me on assignment. And I would say, don't wait for a diploma. Don't wait for yeah. a degree. Don't wait for someone or something to tell you if God's urging, nudging, whispering to you, f- trust him. Mm. He wants to he wants to get you in over your head with him 
to see what he wants to do. He just would like you to be present with him in it. Absolutely. I, uh, I find that when we take our eyes off of ourselves and put it onto Jesus, that we start to experience courage that we didn't before yeah. know was there. Um, I think he almost breathes life mm-hmm. into us and he's like, hey, this is possible. And I also find, I think that one of the reasons that there's so many followers of Jesus out there who haven't seen radical moves of Jesus in their personal life, it's because they haven't taken steps with Jesus where the he's the only one that they can depend on. I I find that it's in those moments of, of him asking us to take, have radical faith that he shows up in a radical way. And all of a sudden we're finding that this is who God really is. And he can do crazy things. (laughs) You just have to be willing to let him do those things. And sometimes you got to take a step out, not knowing if your foot's going to land on something in order to see that happen. I I think if we let fear have the final say, then we often miss what God wants to do, yeah. what he could do, uh, like Peter stepping out of the boat. None of those other disciples experienced walking on water. They saw him do it, just like other people may. You may look at them and say, wow, they had that awesome thing happen in their life, but not in mine. I, and... I love, Charlie, what you just said, because when when I was reading through the Gospels, which we talked about in the former episode, uh, Matthew, Mark, yeah. Luke, and John, I got to the fourth one, John, and I get toward the end of the Gospel of John, and I start panicking because, I, like, at this point, I'm, I'm, I've been tracking with these guys and following these guys, and all of a sudden it looks like they're afraid mm. and they're not going to do all the things Jesus had already told them because I'd read it. Mm. Greater things than these you're going to do in my name. And I, I went, oh, my word, oh, my word, look, look, where are what's happening to them? They're they're closed up behind closed doors. They're locked up in yeah. an upper room. They're scared, you know, and and they're self-protecting. And, mm. and then I see them, you know, they kind of go back to fishing. They're out in one of the dude's boats. And 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 I'm going, oh, no, you know, like I'm thinking this was not what Jesus was planning for them. They're going to miss it. And then I remember him calling uh, from the shoreline and calling them in, and he has this conversation with Peter. Sometimes I think what gets us over fear is love. Love is yeah. the most powerful motivation of all. We'll do things for love we'd do for no other reason. Mm. And so Jesus just kept saying to Peter, do you love me? Mm. Do you love me more than these? Do you love me? Will you feed my sheep? Love me. Do you love me? He asked him three times the same question. Because I think Jesus knew love would conquer fear. Mm, It would conquer fear and it would get him into his book of Acts. And so when I read the next book, which was the book of Acts, Nathan, just like you were talking about and Charlie, like the exciting stuff. And I went like I'm a young reader going, oh, my word, like this is so cool. I can't believe this. Like prison doors are shaking off their hinges and (laughs) people are like uh, this wild and crazy stuff that was going on. And I went, wow, if that kind of stuff's still happening, let me in. Yeah. And then I realized these were not people operating by fear. They were operating by faith. And um, they they had begun to step beyond themselves. And the other really cool, amazing thing I began to see was in the book of Acts, they were identified as untrained, unschooled, ordinary men. Now, they'd been trained by Jesus, but the typical way people thought you had to be trained to make a high impact was you had to go th- through rabbinical training. You had to, you know, you there were all kinds of hoops and jumps and things you had to do, and you had to be in school with this and that. And all of a sudden, these regular people, I mean, massive movements are taking place. And what I remembered recognizing was it was people who you and I might have called untrained were just sharing their stories Mm. with each other, their stories about Jesus, their stories about what happened in their life because of Jesus. And as they transferred story by story by story, and they would they would share these stories. um, I, I saw that these untrained people began to propagate the gospel, the good news that Jesus uh, not only was real and alive, resurrected from the dead, but his transformative power mm. had impacted their lives. Mm-hmm. And so I've often told crowds of people, you think you're untrained, but you're wrong. Mm. 
Mm. How many of you God has ever shown up for you? You you didn't know how you were going to get through something. You didn't know what you were going to do. You didn't know, you know, how are you going to pay a bill or how how many if he's ever shown up for you raise your right hand. And almost every person I'll look around it looks to me in a crowd like every person has their right hand up. I'll say leave your hand up. Now and and, and I tell our listeners, you know, you 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 deserve to give God a little credit here. So if he's ever shown up for you, raise your right hand. Now, if he's shown up more than once for you, like you know he's shown up more than once, put your left hand up and both hands in the air. Now, if you're driving, maybe be a little careful when you're listening. <laughs> but, but I'll look around the room and all these hands in the air and I'll say, leave your hands up, leave them up. Mm-hmm. Now look around this room. Mm-hmm. Do you know what these are? These are our God stories. And there is a world that you and I engage who if they read the scriptural stories, they might think in the back of their minds, well, yeah, but that was a long time ago. But these hands in the air, Hmm. our stories say he still shows up. And untrained people are not really untrained. We just need to know the power of stories. I I, I remember one of my friends said the 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 war for for souls is won through the weapons of stories. Mm. The scriptures are seventy five percent stories mm. of how God showed up for people and with people. When we share our God stories, how He's shown up for us, that is the way we share the good news with other people. Mm. So so I think that's the other thing that people need to get over themselves that, well, I'm not trained. I haven't been to Bible college or haven't been to a seminary or I haven't read enough books yet. Well, listen, has he ever shown up for you? Come on, <laughs> tell some other people. Mm. Yeah, Absolutely. I think that's huge. And I think we've discovered that reality as well. Um, we've had some training, uh, those of us on this podcast. We've also had times before that training. But I would say some of the greatest things we've seen Jesus do and movements and works that he's done and that we've witnessed here in our lives and other people's lives and around the world have not been a direct result because we got Bible training. Uh, It's been we read the scriptures and said, let's give it a try. He said, so let's try it. And we've seen him at work and we've learned along the way. And uh, I would I would people sometimes ask, well, you had this training and you did this or that. I'm like, well, Actually, I just watched other people doing it and read the scriptures. And most of what I do today is formulated around that, not my theological degree. Right. And I think that makes a massive difference. I think the key to what you just said there is, well, he said it or he did it. Jesus said it. Jesus did it. And uh, if I mean, if he's really the king, if he really is the the Lord of the universe, the creator of all things, uh, I think if he did it, if he said it, it's true. And we can we can take it all the way to the bank. Uh, I I like to use this phrase. Uh, you could bet your life on it. Yep. You know, like uh, mm. you could bet your life on it. You know, I I uh, I think sometimes we we think words are the only way, but it is remarkable to me that Christ in us, which Scripture teaches us again and again and again. It was what Paul prayed for the Ephesians when he wrote, you know, to to the one who can do immeasurably more than all we ask, imagine, according to his power that is at work within Mm. us, to him be glory. Um, And and he said to them, I'm praying that you're going to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Mm. So crazy how you often can sense the presence of Christ yeah. in another person. We, I, I was with a young man that I'm, I'm teaching to drive. Mm. Uh, his, he, he called me and said, I need to learn to drive. Would you be willing to teach me? And I, well, I, That's kind of like taking your life in your own yeah. hands or putting <laughs> your life in somebody else's hands, you know. And, uh, and this past weekend, I felt like uh, I was getting up in the morning and I felt like God said, why don't you do more than teach him to drive? Why don't you take him to lunch? Mm. So I took him to lunch and I, I felt like I knew where we were supposed to go for lunch. Um, and it's not the cheapest place, um, but I went to this spot for lunch. And as I'm with this young man uh, who has been, Charlie, with you in surge training, uh, training for youth uh, yeah. a number of years ago, 
and um, now he's learning to drive and we're we're sitting there talking about Jesus um, our server comes and her server looks tired um, and I said hey are you okay you look like you've, you're having a tough day and he said well I worked a full day yesterday I wasn't supposed to work today but somebody didn't show up and so I got called at the last minute I am tired I closed up last night and cleaned up the restaurant and here I am again today oh. so he was tired um, so we, we kind of befriended him a little bit but this young Surge alumni student, teenage kid. Um, when our meal came, I asked uh, him if he would like to pray for our meal, and, and he did. And I noticed as he was praying, our server went to come back to our table to see if everything was okay, and then didn't interrupt us because this young man was still praying. And uh, later on, he came, and this young man talked to him several times. But it wasn't about the scriptures. It wasn't. Uh, we were just loving him, loving him, just caring about him and expressing interest in him. Uh, he, at the end of the meal, came back to our table and said, you guys just need to know I'm not religious. Uh, there's nothing religious about me. But there's like, and his word was energy. Mm. He said, there's energy coming off your table. Every time I walk up to your table, there's energy. What is that? That's not this young teenage kid in me. That's Christ in us. Mm. Christ in us. And we began to have conversation with him, talked with somebody later who knows there's another Christian that works there and went, wow, isn't that amazing that that sometimes that's the other thing. When we get over ourselves and we just begin to do what Jesus said, not only love God with all or everything, but love that person that's in our sight line. For our lunchtime, he was our neighbor. Mm. He was serving us, but he's our neighbor. He's the one we're seeing consistently. And are we seeing him? Are we stopping with him? Are we spending time with him? And we recognized. And then at the very end, he said, every time you come here, will you ask for me? So I believe it's the beginning of a relationship <laughs> yeah. with this young man who needs to know that what he was feeling coming off the table is the living Christ alive in us. That's the hope of glory. Wow. What a testimony. Like, t I've never had a waiter ask if I could show up again to their table. So I'll have to work harder, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, or just uh, I, I think the interesting thing, we, we kind of walked away shaking our heads like, wasn't that amazing? But the last thing he said to us um, was, um, you know, isn't it interesting? I wasn't supposed to work today, mm. but that I came to work. And um, I think I came to work because I was supposed to serve your table. And we walked away, we prayed for him and went, God, he certainly must feel seen by you. Mm -hmm. This was God's idea. And I think every day, if we'll just recognize God's always got a plan yeah. that he's working on. And we just want to be collaborators with him. We want to be participators with him and live eyes wide open. What are you up to, God? How do I join you in that? So, Amen. Yeah. I, I love that concept of what people will will see or taste or experience around us wherever we go the aroma of Christ around us and within us and uh, that had happened to me once before um, I was in a college Bible study while I was in college and a girl walked in there was a significant number of people that would go to this Bible study this girl walked in and I'd never seen her there before so I said hey I'm Charlie nice to meet you what brought you here tonight and she said well uh, I just happened to walk into the church on Sunday and uh, uh, I felt a positive energy. <laughs> I took a step back for a second and I thought, okay, she doesn't know Jesus. Nobody uses that language in a church. She has no idea. And I said, oh, that's great. Well, we're so glad you came tonight and love to talk more. And uh, after the Bible study, we got to talk more. And uh, I said, so like, is this your first time you had gone to church or what's your background? And she said, yeah, I'm from China. I've never been to a church before. It was right across from my apartment, so I just decided to check it out. And uh, then I heard about this young adults Bible study, so I came and uh, wanted to learn more about it. And I said, well, that that energy that you described is actually the presence of Jesus, the presence of God, the Holy Spirit he describes with us. And uh, she said, wow, that's really interesting. And then went on to ask maybe 10, 15 questions. A small group of us were sitting with her at a table. Uh, question after question after question. I mean, she had a thousand questions about Jesus, about the Bible. How is he trustworthy? How do you know it's him? And you name it. She asked every hard question there is. Why is there still suffering in the world if God is good? She asked every question in the book. And we did our best to answer as best as we could. 
Um, but like we've talked about, it's God leading it. It's his aroma. It's what he's up to. We don't know necessarily what he's going to have for you in a day. And um, while we were sitting there, we were compelled to take it a step further. And I had this picture in my mind prayerfully while she was sitting across the table of this ladder between her and God, her at the bottom and God at the top. And almost like every step of the ladder was her next question. And she thought that she had to answer them to get to God. So finally, I said, man, you have great questions. Um, but do you, do you feel like God's at the top of a ladder and maybe you have to answer every question you have before you can reach him? She said, that's exactly how I feel. I said, well, the good news is Jesus meets you where you're at, where you at. He wants to come to, down the ladder and engage with you right now. And what better way to answer your questions than to do it with the one who made all the questions? And uh, she said, that makes perfect sense. She gave her life to Christ right then and there. Uh, it was an incredible, incredible night. But that all started with her seeing believers and sensing this aroma of Christ about them. And just to think, uh, no matter how a conversation may or may not end, that wherever we step foot, man, people could be experiencing the aroma of Christ through us. And how exciting is that? And I think the sor- we have to remember that the source of that aroma is not something that we're kind of mustering up inside of ourselves. Like it's not something that somehow I can fake, you know, it it, it comes from hanging out with Jesus. It comes yeah. from having his spirit in us. It comes from spending time together and, 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 and knowing his word. And, 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 and I think it's it revealed as we and, love God and we love others. Right. They'll know you're my disciples. Jesus said by your love. Right. Exactly. And ultimately, G, the point of what I was trying to say is Jesus is the source of it. Yeah. Like it's it's not just it's not just because you're Charlie. It's because yeah, it, if it's G- just me, people will be running. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, 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 as we go back to the unschooled, untrained, ordinary guys, what they said of them is, "But they've been with yeah. Jesus," mm-hmm. and yeah. they recognized that the power of the living, resurrected mm-hmm. Christ is that's the quintessential total difference. Yes. And whether you describe mm-hmm. it as one of my friends who's halfway around the world said somebody said to him you smell like somebody else that I met in another country and and when he asked him what do you mean I smell like <laughs> and he thought it was like a cologne or a perfume or something. He said, no, I don't know how to describe it with another word, mm. but it would be the fragrance of Christ. There is the beauty of Christ. The presence of Christ is undeniable. Um, so I think the the beautiful thing, Charlie, with what you shared, I remember being attracted to Christ mm. In others, I yeah. saw others. Yeah. They weren't perfect people. Mm-hmm. They weren't. They weren't perfect in any way, shape, or form. But there was some measure of Christ in them that was. I didn't have that. And the, my first reaction with the first person was, I was so unnerved. I was angry because I couldn't understand how did this person, whatever they had, was so much more than I had, and I couldn't. I, my brain couldn't compute mm-hmm. it fast enough, and I, mm-hmm. it just made me angry. But eventually, I recognized, I don't have. I don't need all the answers to all my questions. I need the answer. Yeah. Who they have, what they have, I want that. The way, and the so, truth. He, yes, I recognized that he was the embodiment of what I was looking for. And I was I was sensing, tasting, smelling him. Mm-hmm. I wanted him, not a portion. I wanted all yeah. of him. Well, I think that's a perfect place to wrap up the episode is focus on him, Jesus, and I think if we do that, that pretty much overcomes all our obstacles in the end. Yep. Uh, his love for us, our love for him, and I don't know what that can't overcome. Don't you love the words of Jesus? I am the way. Yes. I am the truth. I am the life. We want to come to Jesus. Amen. Well, Dwight, thank you so much for joining the last couple of podcasts. It's been such a blessing to have you here. I know that I feel rejuvenated just having a conversation with you. So I can only imagine that yeah. uh, everyone who's listening is also feeling encouraged and emboldened. So oh, praise the living Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you all for joining this episode of Fuel for the Harvest. God bless you.